welcome indeed. So if you were not with us for the four previous engagements, you are here today and you have seen where we have been. We can't say we have failed, but we know with all of you in the room, we are going to succeed. It gives me pleasure now to introduce you to our guest of honor, His Excellency Fahad bin Mohammed Alatir. He was appointed chairman of the Qatar National Food Security Program in year 2008. His Excellency Alatir is the legal counsel to the office of the heir apparent at the Emiri Diwanto and sits on the Legislation Council of Qatar. Prior to joining the Qatar National Food Security Program, His Excellency served in the Qatar Armed Forces, training at the Royal Military Academy in the United Kingdom and serving with the elite Grenadier Guards in the United Kingdom and with the Special Forces in Qatar. His Excellency Alatir read law at Westminster University and attended his legal practice course at BPP Law School in London. He has served at the Legal Directorate of the Armed Forces in Qatar and as a military lawyer. Your Excellency, I'm happy to introduce to you over 600 people who are here to share their passion of the sector that's most important in feeding us all. But more than the 600 people who are here, we have over 6,500 people following us on Twitter. The audience is real and virtual, and Your Excellency, this is your time. Good morning, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Let me first thank Mrs. Subanda for her very much gracious introduction. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, corporate team CMPA delegates and observers, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen, those in the virtual world. Welcome to Doha. Welcome to the driest spot on earth, or one of the driest at least. And welcome to the, to, to the session, Agriculture, Landscape and Livelihood, day five, or, or apparently day six, as I can see it. It is great pleasure for me to be here this morning and to kick off what certainly will be an outstanding event. Please allow me to begin by sincerely thanking the various co-hosts, sponsors, and org organizers of this wonderful gathering. As I scan the room this morning, I see many friends and I see a lot of sister organizations that I have once <clears throat> answered the call of partnership and collaboration. As I scan the room this morning, I'm also struck by the amount of expertise and the wealth of resources at our disposal. Yet with the challenges at hand, everyone's contribution will no doubt be essential. It is therefore my hope that this conference can help strengthen our common cause in developing solutions for people in drylands and beyond with the productive insights, new synergies, and innovative models. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, the issues facing Dry lands, dry land countries need no introduction, covering about 40% of, of the earth and home to about 2 billion people. Dry lands can no longer be seen as a marginal problem that requires ad hoc solutions. In fact, what dry, lands, what dry land countries need is much more political attention and an even greater amount of technical innovation. What dry land country needs is tailored solutions at the local level integrated systems at regional level and, at, and collaborative models at an international level. And so this morning I would like to talk to you about two initiatives that are very close to my heart, which aside from COP18 have kept me quite busy over the past couple of years. First, the Qatar National Food Security Program, and the second one is the Global Dryland Alliance. To the Qatar National Food Security Program, it was established in 2008 by His Highness Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, the heir apparent of the state of Qatar. The program consists of an intergovernmental task force, about 19 agencies, to elaborate and implement a comprehensive master plan geared towards achieving food security 
in Qatar by 2024. QNFSP has set out to reach ambitions, uh, ambitious goals using renewable energy and especially solar power while developing R&D centers, educational facilities, and innovative public policies, as you can see in the slide above. This is just a, a snapshot of what the master plan will encompass. We have about 60 people already working, and we will scale up to about 350 by the end of next year. The program is a tailored solution for Qatar, and it aims to foster the integration of systems at the regional level, with a focus on shared research and policy improvement. That is why Doha was the host for in the inaugural Food Security in Drylands Conference, or the FSDL, last 14th and 15th of November. With more than 500 participants coming from all, over, from all around the world, the FSDL proved a great success and attracted a very diverse crowd, scientists, policymakers, industry players, governmental officials, journalists, students, and civil society members. The conference further highlighted the growing importance of water and food security as a global issue, but it also produced a direct action and clear commitments. Chief among which is the Doha Declaration that was approved during a ministerial session of the conference. Among several other ambi ambitious pledges, the declaration called upon all governments to collaborate and allocate 10% of their national budget resources to food security. The timing of the FSDL, or the Food Security Conference in Dryland, was no accident either. And our goal was for its outcome document to enrich and anchor the discussions of COP18. Now we all know about the disappointing aspects of agriculture that has been deferred to COP19. My colleague today, this morning, has updated me on this issue. But I assure you that we're committed to this and that we'll be addressing it in the days to come, ensuring that COP19 will take rigorous actions towards this issue. But more broadly speaking, on the Food Security and Dryland Conference, was important to me because it set tone for regional and international cooperation going forward. Again today, we have another chance to reflect on globally shared experiences in order to distill the best practices around supporting livelihoods and sustaining our natural resources. Similar to the outcome of the Food Security Conference, the, the product of today's gathering clearly ought to feed into COP18. For the impact of climate change on water and food security will be enormous. This is especially true for those for those of us who come from dryland countries, where drinkable water is a precious resource and arable land is a rare gift. In light of these challenges, my own country believes that this is a time for action and that water and food security is an issue in which all make a difference, specifically by fostering the type of collaborative models that drylands so desperately need. And so the state of Qatar has, has stepped forward and proposed an international initiative to create the Global Dryland Alliance. The GDLA represents a concerted effort of arid and semi-arid countries to tackle the threats of climate change and food insecurity. It's focused on two tangible purposes, prevention and response, under prevention the member states of the alliance will engage in joint research programs, develop stronger food crisis response capabilities, and elaborate common food security policies. Under response, the members of the alliance would commit to mutual assistance and, in fact, enter into mutual agreements to support each other in times of crisis. In pursuit of this vision, the GDLA will first center around potential member states, and I'm delighted to report that 15 countries have already answered the call. But we will also look into multilateral entities and research institutions like FAO, EFAD, the World Bank, the IDB, and the CGR system, and others to promote the concept and to build strong partnerships toward our common goal. In doing so, the GDLA's job also will be to contribute a vision for a new type of multilateralism what I call the multilateralism of the 21st century, a 
multilateralism that is tailored, needs-based, and reactive and voluntary, but also, but also a multilateralism that is representative and inclusive of all perspectives, north and south, developed and developing, public and private, research-based as well as implementation-focused, governmental and non-governmental. In a nutshell, a type of consortium that is not unlike the spirit animating us this morning and from which much is to be learned. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to reiterate what a pleasure it is to be with you this morning and to be part of such a distinguished gathering. I wish you all a very productive and insightful day and I very, I very much look forward to the conclusions of our collective work. There's a Greek proverb, Greek proverb which says, a society grows, society grows great when an old man plants trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in. This is what we are trying to do here in Qatar and beyond our borders. And I believe this is precisely what all this event is all about. Building a future which we can, which we can be confident in as leaders, citizens, or simply parents. Building a world in which access to water and food security becomes a reality for all, irrespective of geography and wealth. Thank you very much. Excellency, we have heard you. The semi-arid and the arid countries have a voice. Food security is about water and agriculture. You have formed a coalition, a coalition that will be proactive, but also responsive. And you are calling upon the whole world to join forces because we have to be in it together. We are all in it. Thank you very much for sharing with, you, with us your passion and the footsteps you have taken. But I want to believe the people who are here will commit to making sure we get to the destination together. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move on to the next session. This is the high level panel. That's going to take us on a journey that looks forward. We want to identify scalable solutions we want to talk about the gaps in our knowledge, the trade-offs that we have to make in addressing climate change impacts for agriculture, landscapes, and livelihoods. Panelists, please take the floor. I have with me four distinguished panelists whom I'm going to introduce as they come up. Starting from the far end, we have Tony Lavina, who is the Dean of the Ateneo School of Government in the Philippines. Tony is a veteran negotiator of climate and land use issues, having participated in UNFCCC processes since COP1 in Berlin. He has also chaired the LULUCIF negotiations in Kyoto in 1997, and the Red Plus negotiations in Copenhagen and last year in Durban. He's based in the Philippines and is a member of the Philippine delegation here at the COP. Welcome, Tony. Next to Tony, we have Professor Judy Wakungu, who is the Executive Director of the African Center for Technology Studies, ACTS, a Nairobi-based international intergovernmental science technology and environmental policy think tank, which works on generating and disseminating new knowledge through policy analysis, capacity building, and outreach. Since 2011, she has served with 12 other eminent scientists from around the world on the Commission on Sustainable Agriculture and Climate Change, which was sponsored by the CGIR, CCAFS program, and the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. Welcome, Professor Wakungu. Third, we have Dr. Mahmoud El Sol, the Director General of ICADA. 
he's bringing to us today over 30 years experience in international agriculture research and development in developing countries, particularly in the dry areas. He started his profession as a career person with the Ford Foundation as early as 1972. He moved on to ICADA, then the American University in Beirut, and FAO before coming back to ICADA and taking up the position of Director General in 2006. Dr. El Sol has in-depth knowledge of the needs and aspirations of the National Agriculture Research and Development Systems in non-tropical dry areas and brings to us a wealth of experience on food security, poverty reduction through agriculture. Welcome, sir. Ahlan wa Thank you. And finally, we have a farmer. Robert Carlson is currently the president of the World Farmers Organization, a grouping that brings over 50 farmer organizations worldwide, but he's also the vice president of the international relations for the National Farmers Union in the United States of America. He has extensive experience in farming systems around the world and is actively engaged in international processes such as the one we recently had in Rio Plus 20 in Brazil. Mr. Carlson brings a particular passion and interest focusing on the issue of family farms, both as a farmer and also as an active advocate. Welcome to my panelists. Please relax <laughs> and take us on a journey. We are all here to understand why agriculture and is this the right platform to be talking about agriculture? You've spent all your life farming. Why agriculture and why here? Why couldn't you be at your farm? Why come all the way from the United States just to come and talk about agriculture here? Why? Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I came here because uh, there's a need to represent farmers on the world level uh, like never before. This is a very exciting time to be a farmer. Uh, I have farmed a number of years, as you can probably tell, and I don't know of any time when farmers' opinions and thoughts and, uh, and uh, 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 thoughts about what do we need to do in the future has been so important to world leaders. And why is that? It's not because people are suddenly in love with the rural lifestyle or with farmers. It's because we're concerned about food security in the future. The world leaders who worry about these things are worried about food security because there's nothing more important to human life than food and water. We need it to exist. We can do without cell phones and all kinds of things. We can't do without food and water. And uh, our surpluses that we spent most of our lives as farmers for the past uh, 30 years or 40 years, maybe 50 years, worrying about the fact that we produce too much food, uh, those days are gone. We don't have the big food stocks in dairy and meat and grains that we had uh, for many, many years when I was farming. Now, supply and demand are in rough equilibrium. And the question is, when we're adding 220,000 people to the dinner table every day in this world, that's births over deaths every day in this world. Uh, in 16 days, we add the equivalent of the city of Rome, three and a half million people to the earth. Can we feed those people, given the resources that we have that may diminish, especially water? That's a good question. I think, I think the answer has to be yes, because uh, the alternative is too horrible to, con uh, to contemplate. The other thing that we uh, do as farmers, of course, uh, and that's becoming more realized, I hope, especially by this body, uh, is the fact that farmers are the largest group of me uh, resource managers on Earth. Uh, mm -hmm. we, are, we are controlling what happens to most of the tillable land and pasture land on this planet. Yeah. So if we want to make advances in how uh, the environment is affected uh, uh, in terms of climate change and water quality and, air and many other things, we have to consider farmers and we have to ask farmers what it is they need and what it is that's important to them. So it's a great time to be a farmer. Uh, it's an exciting time. I wouldn't say necessarily that it's a great time, but it's an exciting time to be a farmer. And it's time for us to speak for ourselves on the world stage and that's what our organization is here to do.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The farmers are here to speak for themselves. They are here to tell us they are in the business forever because we are, they are not producing enough. We need more. You've spent 30 years researching. Surely isn't it enough now? And no. why here? <laughs> <laughs> OK, let me really start by saying, uh, really, agriculture is the backbone for food security and improving livelihood of the poor. But it is also extremely important to both the poor and the rich. Mm -hmm. And very frankly, if we look at the horizon, the 2050, we know that we have to increase food production by 70 percent. Okay. With the degradation of natural resources, as Robert indicating, this is the big challenge. Certainly, without science and technology, there is no way we can meet the food demand. And I have to mention, particularly, what I have heard, unfortunately, last night about agriculture not being on the agenda or the work plan of the uh, Climate Change Convention, it is really shocking to hear that, simply because of the fact that climate change implications on food security, all components of food security, production, mm -hmm. stability, accessibility, and utilization, they are extremely serious. And therefore, considering this fact, and considering the fact that agriculture is certainly part of the problem, but a major part of the solution of climate change. If we do not put agriculture on the agenda, this means we are not serious and unwise. I'm sorry to so say that. So as a scientist, you are saying, what a shame. Exactly. What exactly. a waste of time. It, and the fact that we already, as has been mentioned by His Excellency, you know, Sheikh Fahd Al-Atiyah, we can certainly combine also mitigation along with adaptation. If in agriculture, we work on adaptation and production system resilience in, mm -hmm. in dry areas and beyond. And both of these have direct implications of mitigation. Yep. Think about the vast areas of rangelands. If we take only Central Asia and the Caucasus, you have 400 million hectares of rangelands, which are really degraded. And if we really rehabilitate those and stop degradation, including the issue of land degradation, yep. I think you will be creating a major sink, which is extremely important for climate change. So I know politics is always there, but I think at the end of the day, we have to think about the global interest rather than an individual country interest for economic and otherwise. I'm Thank sorry you. to say that. Tony, the scientists say what you are doing as negotiators is haram. <laughs> you cannot be playing games with us. You boast of having been there at COP1 in Berlin. Mm -hmm. Two, three, four, five, six. Where are you taking us to? Do you want us to get to COP100 without uh, agriculture, without food, without water? Are you killing us? What is the problem with the negotiation process? Why can't we talk about people and life? I'm not sure if I boast about being there in, uh, in uh, COP number one, or that makes me a fossil among negotiators. Uh, there's probably like 50 of us left from, from COP uh, one. But I was very young when I started. I was, I was, <laughs> I was actually a doctoral we, student. We excuse you. Let's uh, start from but, COP 15 uh, then. No, no, but, but there's a history behind all of this. Uh, and it's not a justification because there is no justification for not doing it now. Okay. But the history simply is that the Climate Change Convention in Rio was not seen as a land use, agriculture, or even a forest uh, convention. It was seen essentially about industrial gases. And very few understood then, even if in principle we knew that uh, a comprehensive approach to climate change was necessary. And it's in the convention, actually, from the very beginning. But very few understood uh, the role of forest, the role of agriculture, the role of soils in, in all of this. Uh, it takes an average for a land use uh, agenda to be included in the COP. It takes an average of three to five years to put it in. Who, starting, sets, who sets the three to five years? Just educate us so that we can find it's, a shortcut. It's the, first, it has to come from places like this, uh, like the, the all day, to push the agenda forward. Then some countries take it on and champion it uh, and convince the other countries. 
but part of the process that then there are concerns, but what are we talking about when we talk about agriculture? We're talking about trade, for example. That's the, that's the elephant in the room here right now in, in the substance negotiations. People are afraid that this becomes a trade. You know, what, the approach to agriculture will be about trade rather than about adaptation uh, and, and, and mitigation. So uh, what happens here is uh, uh, you need to, and, and this is sort of look, look, looking forward, uh, you have to be very, very clear about what an agriculture uh, uh, program would be under the, the, the SABSTA. Uh, you look at the draft text right now, it's very delicate negotiations going on. I mean, essentially, the, the, the SABSTA decision is to bring it back to SABSTA. I actually didn't realize that SABSTA is now like a limbo, a purgatory, where <laughs> if you can't decide on something, you just give it, give it back to... Yeah. To, to, to substance. But Tony, that's why we think we are playing games, because we're saying this is the right platform to be pushing. But also in our own countries, we need to be talking. We heard His Excellency, the efforts that are being done, not just in one country, 19 countries have signed on just as semi-arid and arid, but the whole world is affected. Who are these people that we need to educate? Is it this audience? No, it's the political leaders, actually. And in this stage of the COP, it's the political leaders that have to be brought on board uh, to make this their priority. I can tell you the analogy of this is forest, of course. I mean, I, I, I chaired LULUCF in, in 1997 in Kyoto. It took three years to get it in the agenda and a very, very limited opening at that. And then it took RED five years to actually get into the agenda uh, and finally get into the whole, whole, whole process. But that required convincing enough political leaders, enough ministers in this, in this context to make this their priority, their number one priority, where they cannot walk out and go home to, the conf to, their, to their homes without a, a substa or without an agriculture agenda. Thank you very much. The negotiator is saying it's our politicians. I'll come to you, the audience. I'm sure there are politicians who can help us unravel this puzzle. I am puzzled. Professor. Is this the right place, or should we be looking elsewhere? Because really, Tony says it takes three to five years. From the video, we started Copenhagen. So we've, we've matured. We are five years today. Do we need six years? Are we changing the rules of the game? It's no longer three to five years? No, I think, I it, think, I think you needed that. I would have thought last week we would have made it. I didn't understand. We didn't. Yeah, so that means you... You know, I mean, I, I think I think we have experiences of, of uh, the other issues as well that takes, you know. But but there's still another week left, and the Qatari leadership is very important for this. We've got one week left, but Professor, is this the right place? Are there other opportunities? Where should we be looking? Because it looks like yes, we will do it here, but we've heard about the political climate that may not be too conducive. Where else do we look up to? I think we have to look everywhere and look at all opportunities that we have, especially if you look at agriculture mm -hmm. and food security holistically. People don't live in sectors. They don't live in departments. Mm -hmm. They live holistically. And this is definitely the right place uh, because our policymakers are here, the scientists are here, the technicians are here, the inventors are here, the farmers are here. This is definitely the right place. It's also the right place because I have a very difficult job and I'm always under stress because our policymakers want solutions. They want to know what is the best science, what is the best technology, and what is it that we can do to alleviate some of these uh, problems. And also, there's a lot that's happening in so many different arenas, whether it is here, whether it's G8, whether it's G20. Um, but all of this information actually comes together. And if we look at it in terms of our own livelihoods and trying to make a difference, we need to work collaboratively to bring all this expert information to bear and then to make holistic decisions about how we can solve problems. This is not about developing your own particular discipline. Yeah. This is about solving very, very difficult issues that we face. Professor says we need to stay on board even if it's year five. Are there other platforms that we should be using? We are now clear who our target is. Governments, politicians, we need to make sure we tame them and hold them to account. 
anyone from the audience who wants to give us quick wisdom in terms of where we should be looking. Jerry Nelson? Over here. <laughs> wisdom. Another body that I think has already spoken and needs the, the delegates at the UNFCC needs to listen to them is the CFS. It's the Committee on World Food Security, which is a body that consists both of 110 or so countries, but also representatives from, CF, from the civil society, from the research community, from international organizations in the private sector. That body, there will be a report presented later this afternoon. I was chair of the writing team that prepared that report. and the, and the Delegates to the 30, the most recent CFS meeting um, passed on that report to the UNFCC asking them to take it into consideration as they consider their discussions on uh, food security and climate change and agriculture as part of SUBSTA. And I know that it was introduced briefly at the beginning of the SUBSTA discussions. Apparently it wasn't terribly successful in influencing the outcome and I'm hoping we can do something about that later. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Nelson. So, yes. One burning one quickly before we move on and back to our panel. I'm just doing this, ladies and gentlemen, because we are short on time, and I don't want you to tweet that I have not given you time, so I'm attending to you. Yes, thank you. We also need to look at processes which has been set up to address land degradation and desertification, especially, therefore, we've been focused on dry land, where progress has been made precisely to uh, target improvement in managing land and also avoiding degradation. And this is needed. Uh, UNCCD is the process uh, in that regard. So we also need to look at those type of mechanisms, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Panel, surely something is working on the ground. We are not just sitting and waiting. There are some success stories. There are things that are specific that we need from our governments so that we can scale up these successes. I'll start with the farmers. Where are we succeeding and we want to scale up? And what do we need from our governments? Because we've heard that part of the challenge is in our home countries. Let's convince them by scaling up. What would you scale up? And what would you need from government? Clearly the thing that needs to be scaled up most quickly is the uh, uh, increased production in the developing countries' farms. And, uh, and that's, uh, th that takes a lot of uh, multi-pronged efforts from infrastructure to delivery of uh, education uh, to incentives for farmers to make investments, credits, even secure property rights. Women farmers make up 70 percent of the farmers in some parts of the developing world. In many cases they don't even have the right to own property whatsoever and so uh, it's a, it's a multi-pronged problem but it's one we need to be focused on and get going on. I think perhaps, let me make a bold statement and, and maybe some people will disagree. I hope It's I your hope time, do. so give us the bold statement. I will say that the United Nations has never faced such a comprehensive global problem in its existence as we have in the combination of food security and its attendant threat uh, because of climate change. Mm -hmm. These things need to be solved. You asked who we need to convince. We need to convince political leaders, but we also need to convince the public because in many parts of the world, uh, the, the political leaders will respond to whatever way the public winds are blowing. And uh, simple, well, anyway, I shouldn't get into All politics. All right, but, so we, we are in to it together. We need to focus. This is a crisis, and we need to yep. think ahead, because it isn't something you can solve uh, quickly. It's, yep. it's a long term, and I think it's very important uh, that, we, uh, that we get to work. And we do have successes. Uh, I can name some successes in developing countries. I can name some increased Just give me environmental two successes. benefits. Well, uh, I have seen women farmers take leadership in some developing countries and really uh, show the men uh, how to increase productivity and how to be serious about farming and taking care of raising their families in terms of uh, increased, uh, increased uh, prosperity on their farm. So that's a success. I have seen farmers in the developed world become much more conscious of how they uh, use uh, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, cultivation to be more conservation minded. Thank you very much. So invest in women because they are mothers, they are farmers, they are custodians of the environment, but most important, they know how to do it right. You've been researching. Give yes. me two scalable yeah. things and what you want from government. Uh, 
certainly what, what we want from governments, you mean, more investment in science and technology. And if we look at the developing countries and how much they really invest, I'll tell you less than 0.5% of their gross national production. Some countries, even they invest less than 0.2%. Mm. While, you know, we know very well the developed nations, they invest 2 to 3%. Of course, the other aspects that there are so many, uh, I would say, clear solutions for two major agroecologies in dry areas. One is the favorable, relatively favorable environment where sustainable intensification of production systems is very feasible. Yeah. You have varieties that are adapted to drought. You have varieties that are adapted to heat as well, which all are implications of climate change. And of course, the other aspects, the other agroecology is the marginal land, where we have clear success stories on the development of integrated production systems of crops, rangeland, and livestock, particularly sheep and goats, mm -hmm. in the low rainfall areas. So I think I, solutions are there. All you need is really more investment. So your one message is more finances into agriculture, sure, and, and we will be able yeah. to Certainly. upscale our research and development so as to find solutions for improving production. One more point, more also investment in technology transfer to the farmers. Okay. Because there are so many technologies on the shelf did not find their way to the farmer again. So this is another type of investment that we need. Okay. You give us more money, we will put it into research and transfer of the knowledge to those who need it most so that they can increase production in a sustainable way. Thank you very much. Madam, you are part of a commission, world-class scientists, 12 of you. What are the quick two wins and urgent calls you have? What do you want done? I think what we would like to, to see be done as a commission is the whole issue of agriculture and climate change to be uh, focused on holistically you know, as I mentioned earlier. And there are already examples of countries that are beginning to respond to this. And let me just give you a cogent ex example uh, from my own country, Kenya, which even as we speak now, is in the throes of uh, upholding the agriculture sector. And rather than having uh, 10 or so different ministries that are looking at agriculture issues, the Kenya government has a bill that's pending right now to make sure that agriculture is looked at holistically, bringing forestry, livestock, wildlife, fisheries, etc., into one ministry. All right, so we are scattered, and if we put everything into one roof, aren't we contradicting what we're saying? Because now we're baking, going back to a silo. Just unpack for us what this will no, we're, do. No, we're actually, we're not actually, we're trying to avoid the silo-specific perspective. This is exactly what we are trying to do by, by forcing livestock uh, experts to talk to actually the crop experts, which they don't like to do, as you know. Professor <laughs> says we are not talking to each other as scientists, as policymakers, because we create these boundaries that see the environment away from agriculture, and yet we talk food security, being safeguarding our natural resources to make sure we feed ourselves. Tony, does this make sense to you? Yes, uh, the silo approach is the reason why we're here today and why the process is so complicated. First, we, we dis divided, we dichotomized between mitigation and adaptation. Then we dichotomized the various land uses. But there's an opportunity to change that with a new process called the ADP. Just uh, explain, unpack well, the Well, the acronym. new process called the uh, uh, Enhanced Action on the Durban Platform is a process of trying to consolidate uh, all the things that we have done so far for a new agreement, but that takes effect in 2020. So it's a post-2020 um, agreement. And here people are discussing a unified approach to, to, to land use. I mean, a okay. uh, common set of rules, uh, uh, common approaches, or at least harmonizing LULUCF, Red Plus, agriculture, and land uses. This is a real opportunity because we're starting from scratch here, and we're brainstorming. So 
I really, really encourage the agriculture advocates to actually pay attention to this process and make sure we start right. Because if we're going to start again with silos in this new agreement, then we repeat what happened, which is the history of the convention. The first 10 years was simply about mitigation. That's why agriculture was, was very difficult for agriculture to, to, to get into. It was very, very threatening. Adaptation came only starting 2000, 2001, 2002. Um, but in this new process, adaptation and mitigation can, can be unified and the various land uses can be, can be put together in a landscape approach that really makes sense. No, 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 Thank you that. very much. So we have a new approach that's going to embrace all of us in the various sectors so that we have a common goal to safeguard our natural resources, but also be productive in a responsible manner. Yes, an what I call an integrated adaptation mitigation approach, because that's what you need for, for, for agriculture. I mean, But Tony, uh, if we are having problems with the people who are speaking for us now, how are we going to make sure they are educated? Because you have all these eminent people who have the knowledge, but we are hitting a brick wall, brick wall, because on the other side, we are not being heard. Well, well, that's why you you really have to reach out. But you see, that's not the problem, uh, Lindy, the, yes. because people, even those that might be objecting to a Substa agenda on agriculture, know what, know in fact, what know what to do and know what's the right thing about that. So that, that that's not it's not a question of education. Uh -huh. So people it's know. finding the way to break out of of a pattern. You know, okay. uh, and, and that's, a, that's the real problem with the process now. I mean, there's a pattern that has been established since, since 1995, okay. essentially. Uh, and I, I don't want to blame anyone no, for no, that pattern. We, we were all part of that and complicit in, in, in that pattern of building up a convention that was doing it in silos rather than in an integrated approach. But we have an opportunity now with a new agreement. The question, of course, is that there's, some, there's a lot of things. That's why I also support the Substa agenda now, because so much needs to be done between now and 2020, and we really cannot afford to wait until 2020. But certainly, the, that corrective measure is, is, is possible for, for, for the post We just hope we don't have to wait for the year 2020, that it's just a framework, and come next year, we are talking one language. Yeah. Of course, because the, even if it's a 2020 agreement, the deadline for the negotiations is 2015. Excellent. And what happens what, if you do arrive at a good agreement in 2015 and a unified landscape approach in 2015, that will influence things between, especially research will be influenced okay. between 2015 and 2020 to prepare for a 2020 agreement. So, so Thank I you think very much. it's not that long so term. We have hope that uh, we've been partly heard, but in the process, Someone is saying, let's sort out the shop that is doing this whole process. Let's take a more integrated approach. I want to go back to what Mahmoud said about investment in research. 30 years you've been doing it. What are the gaps that you still need to fill if you were to be given more money? Yeah. You know, if we look at the impact of climate change uh, on, on agriculture, mm -hmm. you are talking about extreme temperatures, particularly high temperatures. You are talking about uh, more frequent drought, less rainfall, particularly uh, in the, in the uh, dry areas in particular. And you are talking about shorter growing season, while in the northern latitudes you will have longer growing season. Then you are talking also about emerging diseases and insect pests, and this is one area that is completely neglected in, in the climate change. Uh, even the effect on pollinators, okay. which are so important in setting seeds, people don't think about these things. These are really hidden problems that people don't think about. In 2010, because of the higher temperature in winter, West Asia had very serious yellow rust epidemic mm -hmm. that uh, cut down in some farmers 40% of their wheat production. Uh, and, and therefore, we have a, a, an insect on barley which was located in only one small spot in West Asia. And because of high temperature, it is becoming now an economic insect pest. So I think these are issues that we neglect. Yep. So if we really have more money, 
we can monitor more, not only monitor and find solutions for these things as well. I would like to ask a farmer in the audience, particularly from the developing world, what, what would you, if you had an audience with a researcher who had all the money, what are the gaps in knowledge, particularly when it comes to the impact <laughs> of climate change on agriculture and mitigation potential? Sir, your name and where you're from. Hello. I'm Pradeep Sharma from India, Central India, uh, Madhya Pradesh. In our area, the farmers are committing suicide because of this climate change and its other problems they are facing. Yeah. The productions are, uh, you know, in lots of trouble. This is not the question that the technology and more money would get into that, but it's more important to take their participations. Okay. And they have to... Uh, made them, uh, we have to make them understand that ki this is possible with all these kind of changes also. There are some models by which we can produce more and uh, we can incapacitate them actually to cope up with the climate change. Sir, you are a farmer yes. from India yeah. and India is saying agriculture is important. Yes. And you are telling, speaking for India here saying as a farmer you want agriculture in. Yes, of course, I want Say it louder. In. I want agriculture in from Thank you. India. Thank you to India. We have to say more in our countries because we've been told that we have to equip the negotiators, but most important, the political leadership. But what's more important is when they come back after the negotiations, let's hold them to account and ask what they said when they were in Qatar. Then we are growing. So next time we meet, I'm back to you, India, for an answer on the report back. What are the trade-offs? We've had agriculture as solutions, we've had the gaps, but surely it can't be all win-win. There's got to be some compromises that we, we, we have to make. Professor, what are the trade-offs? Um, there are many trade-offs. I mean, if you look at it from the R&D uh, perspective, as Prof has mentioned uh, here, if we only look at the long-term perspectives and not look at the short-term perspectives, then again, the disenfranchised, uh, more challenged farmers may be overlooked, and that could be a trade-off. Uh, we could also overlook the issues of, that women face, you know, as the largest and you know, probably the most important resource managers or farmers, uh, especially, say, in the African milieu or the Asian milieu. We tend to talk about the important role that women play, but because they're not sitting in the boardroom, when it comes to really focusing on what we need to provide for them, uh, land rights, you know, for example, we might you know, forget about them. So that could be uh, another trade-off. Another trade-off could also be, I mean, I'm very concerned about the status of uh, agricultural uh, education uh, in our schools, particularly starting from primary school. Again, we could focus mostly at the macro level without really focusing on what do we need to be teaching our children in terms of survival? How do we need to overhaul their curriculum to be more realistic with the future that we face? I'd like to hear a grounded position from the farmer. What, what we hear win-wins, but surely there's something you need to trade off. What are the trade-offs? I think there are trade-offs to be made. Um, between uh, food security uh, or more production uh, and environmental benefits, but I don't think there are trade-offs very much between mitigation and, or between adaptation and mitigation because uh, a farmer that adopts techniques that put more carbon in the soil, that add organic matter to the soil, increases the water uptake and storage in the soil, uh, it's good for the environment, captures carbon, it's good for production in the long term. There may be some short period of time, a couple of years, when there's a little less production because of the transition to more sustainable type farming from, over, from uh, what had been many uh, use on, uh, on uh, commercial fertilizers and so forth. But uh, adaptation and mitigation go together very, very well on farms. But what I worry about is this tendency we humans have to not deal with a crisis until it is a crisis. Okay. So if we get to the point where we face a severe shortage of food somewhere in the world 
and the exporters can't fill it because it's been filled elsewhere. People will do anything for food, so then we may do rapid deforestation. We may do all kinds of harmful things to the environment because in this desperation to fill a short-term need for food. That's, that's where the real uh, trade-off is potentially disastrous if we don't plan ahead for food security and if we don't plan ahead to grow our food uh, more sustainably and more uh, friendly to mitigation. Yeah. So more money for research, forward-looking um, and yeah. adaptation for now. You know, I mean, the future is owned by those who plan for it today, yeah. okay, clearly. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we are talking about a sustainability dimension, yeah. including economics dimensions, including social dimensions, yeah. and environmental, environmental. dimensions. Yeah. And food security, the sustainable food production takes into consideration all these three sustainable elements. And this is where agriculture and the climate change, you cannot really separate those. And now, I, I, I cannot see the common, there is no common sense. I'm sorry to say, yes, yep. politics is there, but politicians should have common sense to succeed as leaders. I'm sorry to say that. The scientist is saying it's no brainer. Even anybody can tell you that agriculture, climate change need to talk to each other because we are dealing with the issue of food security. Let's not bring politics, let's not create complexities. I would like to hear from you. Tony is sitting here and part of the fights they have is no, it's adaptation, no, it's mitigation. The two should not talk to each other and yet a farmer is saying you cannot be a responsible farmer if you don't increase production in a responsible way by reducing your mitigations. It's not a race for the maximum, it's a race for the optimum production, safeguarding the natural resources. Any divergent views? We've talked about climate smart agriculture being increased production whilst adapting to the already changed climate, but making sure we don't do more damage. That has been our call. Wisdom. Can I have a lady, please? We are going to close this session in a few minutes, so I would like just two more ideas, then we go for the final round. Jan McAlvin with the United Nations Forum on Forests. I want to perfectly accept every single speaker's comments, I think very wise, but I especially like to single out the professor's point about the holistic approach. Yeah. And while the lens should be, as proposed by you, on agriculture and climate change, uh, keeping in mind the cross-cutting nature of natural resources and their, their management and their strategies has to be in that equation. It is manageable and is why uh, we're moving to a landscape approach in future which starts to integrate these issues. Um, that would be my major point in addition to what's been said. Thank you very much. Integrated, holistic approach that looks at landscapes and Tony resonates very well with you. Sam. Good morning, uh, my name is Abbas Zardin from Lebanon. I live in Barcelona at the uh, Universidad de Barcelona doing my PhD. I want only to add uh, something on social sciences. All right. Uh, because I uh, uh, was listening on to invest in science and technology, perfect. I agree, I, I share Dr. Salah. But at Salah level, at national Salah level, this is Arab word. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we say conciliation at national and every national level. We need conciliation. We need uh, trust building. Yeah. We need stakeholder democracy at national level. I'm speaking, I'm not, I don't speak at global or regional or sub-regional. I'm saying that we need at national level something we, we call uh, who's doing what at national level. Yeah. We need maybe to try with this very small investment, 
to assemble, to meet the, every focal point we have at national level. Maybe, maybe this is a crazy idea. I don't know. No, I am, no, we've heard you, I sir. Am, I am, maybe I am proposing here today, if some people here are ready to help me, to help uh, this idea, to try in the future, near future, if we can meet the national focal point on convention on biodiversity, national focal point on desertification, national focal point on adaptation, maybe Thank we you. will have someone like that, or national focal point, and all the conventions we have at global level. Thank, Thank you, very, you much. very much. Lebanon is saying, let's start at country level. Let's speak as one voice. Let's not have government and civil society. Let's not have the adaptation family on one side, the mitigation. Let's speak with one voice. It's about food, and we are all in it. And it's about people and trust. Tony, do you trust this gang? Of course. All right. <laughs> so it means at global level, too, we need to be, speak with one voice. I'm going to go to the Twitter community for a while. Sir, so can we have the mic just to find out what the 6,500 followers we have out there are saying to us? Uh, thank you, Lindy. Um, you certainly stirred up uh, the uh, online and internet crowd. I have uh, one question which I would like to forward uh, through you to the panel. Uh, when we talk about uh, climate change adaptation and agriculture, um, um, we often see the word carbon markets coming up. So the question is, can carbon markets get smallholder farmers to adopt more sustainable farming practices? I'm looking out to the audience for answers. If you have an answer, put a five up and I'll come up to you. Carbon markets, is that the way you want us to, to go? Is that the way to go? And are we really being fair to the world? Sir. Um, good morning, uh, Henry Neufeld from the World Agroforestry Center. And we will have a round table on carbon and climate finance later Give today. us an appetizer now. And the main, yes, exactly. The main message would be that carbon markets can support farmers and development on the ground if we have two things. First of all, community-based organizations to connect the farmers to the climate finance. And secondly, it, we have to be aware that the carbon does not pay for the, car for the farmers. Mm -hmm. the, far the carbon only pays for the projects, but the farmers get a lot of other benefits, adaptation and development, and particularly food security. Thank you very much. So join us online. There is a dedicated session that will unpack this. We are here to learn and to share experiences. There's more questions from the floor, but I'm just left with two minutes, and I love to keep time. I'll hear the questions so that they're on record, and we will answer them in other forums. Just have the mics there. Panel, I'm going to come back to you each for 30 seconds of wisdom. We want to learn. What is the one message that you have for our friends, the negotiators, the policymakers who are here, based on your constituency? What would be the take home? Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jerome Munsey. I'm with the Irish delegation at the talks here. Uh, I've agreed with everything I've heard so far, and I think. It makes perfect sense. But going back to the, the thing about politicians and common sense, someone once said that common sense is not so common. And uh, I think that sometimes applies. Uh, but just a suggestion. Um, I found this discussion so far, and we're at the start of the day, very useful. But I would suggest that the next time you hold an agriculture landscape and livelihoods day, put it at the start of the negotiations. Let these ideas filter through before, because at the moment agriculture is blocked. Thank you very but much, But I think sir. it could feed into the thoughts. Thank you. Very good suggestion. But maybe more than that, let's start at country level. That's what we've heard. Let's walk our way up. But when we have the landscapes, let's start right at the beginning and share the knowledge. There was one more, Benny, one yes, and then we come to the panel. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Andrew Wardell from the Center for International Forestry Research in Indonesia. And many thanks to all the panelists. One of the things that worries me is that given the dominance of the climate change narrative, 
whether in fact we're missing opportunities to look at addressing some of the core underlying problems associated with food production systems around the world. So I had a question to all the panelists. Do we need UNFCC? Do we need the enhanced action process of the Durban platform to address the problems of food waste? Thank you. All right. I said I'll take those questions, but it's up to the panel to put that. I'm giving them a strict 30 seconds for wisdom. Goodbye wisdom. Who's going to be first? Yeah, farming first. Farmers, it's your time. Well, thank you, madam. I'll speak quickly because there's only 30 seconds, and I'll try to, try to adhere to that. I would say the main lesson is this. Uh, our, our friend brought up the issue of, of, of waste. Waste is important, uh, and waste that happens at farm storage needs to be addressed clearly. Uh, I won't talk about the plate waste that we have that we throw away every day. That's, that's another issue that involves uh, human beings and how much they want to eat. But uh, I think the main message I would like to leave is this. We can have grand designs. We can engineer the world for climate, try to engineer it for uh, mitigating uh, climate change and for adap adapting. Clearly, farmers need to adapt because we're all experiencing a change in climate. But we need to always think that farmers wake up in the morning not worried about global issues, but what's going to happen on their farm. And if we want farmers to be involved in adapting and mitigating, we have to find a way to talk to farmers in a way that uh, convinces them, because it's real, that what we're asking them to do is going to make a difference in their lives, because that's what they care about. Uh, how am I going to take care of my family? How am I going to uh, be able to improve this farm adapt it and pass it on to uh, future generations? How can I keep, uh, keep my livelihood together and provide livelihood for others? That's the issue we need to, and I think there's been a gap, uh, Madam Chair, in the fact that with all the grand designs, be it research and so forth, all of it's good, all of it's smart, all of it's needed, but we need to get it to the farmer because they are the ones in control of the land. So the shot is uh, the quote by Sir Norman Bullock, take it to the farmer. Yeah. Okay, uh, certainly when we come to the uh, food waste, it's a major problem, certainly. You were talking about 35% food waste. But on the production systems now, the CGIR or the Consultative Group for International Agriculture Research, which ICARDA belongs to, we have now a program which we call the, uh, actually, integrated production system in the dry lands uh, for food security and improving livelihood in the dry lands, where the focus is going to be on the production systems coming back to a holistic approach where we consider natural resource management as a whole. We consider also crop and livestock genetic improvement and then policy and the socioeconomic dimension. And I think, honestly, without the holistic approach, certainly we are missing a lot. Take it to the farmer, holistic approach. Professor. Um, we're just not here to hold our tough decisions in eloquent debates. We're just not here for that. Uh, the reason I am here is I'd like to see us all become good stewards of the environment and then also to transform livelihoods. I'm not here to just hold a position. We want to change, but change in a responsible way for the better. So let's invest in that. What message, sir, are you taking to your friends, the negotiators? Every, every year, actually. In fact, right after I, I get home from, from the December negotiations, uh, I actually teach a course on climate change uh, negotiation. And I, it's a very detailed uh, uh, course where I let my students, give my students instructions on the various countries that they're, they're playing from a perception of what those instructions would have been to, to the countries. And we're trying to anticipate what happens in, in the next uh, conference, so in this case, Warsaw, uh, what will happen in Warsaw given the stalemates that are here. Um, and the students never come to an agreement, right? Uh, for two <laughs> months, they would keep on fighting, they would, they would keep on, re you can close your eyes and you can think, you can actually, you, you would feel like you're in the convention uh, center. But in the last week of the class, uh, I then tell my students, give them written instructions, the same instruction to each student, uh, to each group of students playing countries. Uh, your, this is, comes from your president or your prime minister. Your instructions have completely changed. You can now do the right thing. Yep. 
And believe it or not, they come to an agreement on everything very fast uh, when they're given the instructions to do the right thing. So that for me is really the, 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 the message that you should bring. I mean, and how do you incentivize countries and negotiators and policymakers and politicians to do the right thing on, on, on agriculture? And, and it can be done. I mean, I, in Lulu CF, coming to Kyoto, we, had, we didn't have a single tax, and we were able to come up with something. In Red Plus, coming to Copenhagen, I had 100 pages of tax, but I was able to reduce that to five pages and get people to, to, to agree. But you have to appeal to people to do the right thing to that. Thank time. you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this session was about looking forward. And clearly, the message I'm taking as we look forward is put the farmer first and take it to the farmer, and the eat being knowledge then the farmer will be a responsible player. Secondly, investment, investment, investment for research and technology transfer, but more important, take a holistic approach. From a mother, from a scientist, the issue is it's all about people. We've brought these people on this land. Let's give them a decent lifestyle. We cannot have a world where the poor are the majority. Let's transform those livelihoods. Then from the governor, from the negotiator, they say they know nothing, they want to be educated. The message I have for you all, find them. We don't know them, we don't know what they look like. Find them before you even get to the COP meeting. Sit them in a classroom, give them the knowledge, but more important, hold them to account when they come back after the COP and India will tell us the response next year. Ladies and gentlemen, join me as we thank our distinguished panelists who've shared their knowledge with us. I want to thank you, the audience, plus the online audience that has stayed on with us, but the day is not over yet. We are going to break for tea now, and we've been a bit generous. I've just eaten five minutes into your tea time. Please take everything that you brought into this room with you as you go to the round tables. The round tables will be displayed on the screens. You'll be able to choose. Some of you have already decided where you're going. And note that immediately after the round tables, we're going to break for lunch at one. We've been very generous with the time for lunch, one and a half hours you've got. Use it to network. But please be back here at 14.25 as we prepare for the Ideas Marketplace. Break for tea, take your belongings, go to the round tables, and be back here after the grab and go lunch that's being provided at 25 minutes past two. The session will start promptly at 2.30. Thank you for your patience and thank you for being a good audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>